Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fantasy Injury Team podcast brought to you by Guys Trip. Are you planning a golf trip, bachelor party, sporting event trip, or just need a weekend getaway with the guys? Guys Trip plans your entire trip and saves you up to 30% off retail pricing for rental homes, transportation, golf, nightlife, and so much more. Visit guystriplive.com. Use the code FIT for an additional 10% off your fee today. Guys Trip just show up. We have reached, my good friends, the halfway point in the NFL season, the playoff picture in both the NFL and our fantasy leagues are starting to take shape. We've got teams like the Ravens, Chiefs atop the AFC. They look like the teams to beat. Ravens looking really good lately. They're going to be some serious contenders. Of course, over in the NFC, we've got Tom's Birds. We've got the Lions. The Niners even seem uh, like they could be a very, very good team and a threat. Tons of co- uh, competitive divisions, too. Just taking a look here as we go through the league. AFC East, uh, good division. Really, really competitive. you got the Dolphins, who we'll talk a little bit about, Tom. I think they're a little fraudulent, and they've been getting their ass kicked by some pretty good teams. you got the AFC North, the Ravens at 7-2. and two. But, Tom, the AFC North, you've got the Steelers, Browns, and Bengals all at 5-3. and three. you got the Lions and Vikings in the NFC North. you got the Niners and the Seahawks in the NFC West. And then, Tom, we've got the uh, Caleb Williams, uh, maybe Drake May, Morphin Harrison Jr. sweepstakes, two and seven Bears, who I think have the Panthers pick. You've got the one and seven Panthers. You've got the one and eight Cardinals, the two and seven Giants, the two and seven Patriots. A lot of stuff to dive into. But as always, we also have a ton of injuries, which we'll sort through today. And that's where we turn to the great doctor of physical therapy, Tom Christ. How the heck are you, Tom? I am busy. I am very, very busy because we have a lot to talk about today. A lot of, um, fortunately, we had some season enders this week, and then a lot of guys coming back from injuries that they've missed a lot of time from, which that we like to talk about. Um, but yeah, a lot, lots to cover today. Lots to cover. How about your fantasy leagues? Doing okay? Are you? Would you be in the uh... – <laughs> so-called Marvin Harrison Jr. sweepstakes, or are you hunting for playoff spots in your um, leagues? It's, I'm all across the board, man. I've got one really high-stakes league that I'm 7-2, and two and I'm about to make a run. Um, I've got one dynasty league where I'm in a full rebuild. Uh, this offseason, I shopped away Cooper Cup, Stephon Diggs, Aaron Jones, Miles Sanders, and several others, and just acquired assets. And I'm nice. uh, looking forward to... Uh, the draft there, I've got three firsts, I've got three seconds, and then I've got numerous future picks as well. Um, and then in my most important league, I started out dreadful one and six. That's where I had Nick Chubb, T. Higgins, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. But we're rallying, Joe. We're three and six now. We've got two in a row. I've had Leonard Fournette stashed for weeks, and he's finally on a roster. So um, <laughs> CJ Stroud's looking really good. So I, I think I may be able to make a run there. You being so optimistic about three and six makes me feel better about in my main league about me being three and six. I just played against Nick who had CJ Stroud and I lost by, I think, under a point. I am running into all sorts of bad luck this year, but also some bad draft picks, which, uh, you know, we're trying to overcome at this point. But I'm good in my vampire league. And we'll talk about that later. The one on one league, I'm doing well in my work league. I'm doing well. But my two big stakes leagues, my my one, I'm, I'm three and or three and six yeah three and six and the other one tom real quick before we get into our show i am in dead last in that league i'm one and what's the math one and eight uh won the first league or won the first week lost eight straight and the punishment in that league for last place which i'm well on my way for right now is i have to show up to the draft dressed as roger goodell in a nice suit and tie looking all good and i have to i think i'm the beer bitch i think but i also have to announce everybody's first three rounds of picks while I get various items thrown at me and booed and that I'm not looking forward to that. I've knock on wood. I've never done a punishment before, but this might be the first one and it's not going to be fun. I think it could be a lot worse than that from a punishment standpoint. It it could. My main league, we have two, we have the beer bitch thing, which I think is, is a, is a fun staple, but my, my league mates were, were mean this year. It's an egg toss. So at next year's draft or whenever an event before we each get like three or four eggs, and we set a distance and you just chuck away and you just get to throw eggs. At, like that's kind of painful. Like we've done mental torture and pain. We've done psychological. We've done sitting in the McDonald's, but 
This one is 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 physical pain. And actually, one last thing that we voted on, and then I promise we'll get to our show, guys, is for the first time ever, I think Jesse brought this up. Next year, we're not going to know our draft spots until 30 minutes before the draft. It's like old school. So we're going to show up. We're going to play like a pong game or something, and we're going to get our picks right before the draft. So a lot of things to look forward to, Tom. But I look forward to talking to you here about some injuries. So a lot of guys here, we'll try to talk through them. Um, and of course, as I put the show together on Wednesday, there has been, have been some updates that have come through. Tom will work us through those, but let's start with some quarterbacks, Tom, Justin Fields, who, when I made this earlier today, looked like he was somewhat on pace to play, but now I'm getting information that he looks like he's out, um, thumb injury. He's already missed three weeks. This would be the fourth. What's going on with Fields, Tom? Not looking like he's going to be ready yet. And they play Thursday or, or today as, as people will be listening to this. Correct. Just not quite enough time to get all that grip strength back. That's the challenge with this injury, with this um, thumb dislocation and sprain, is getting that strength back. And as a quarterback, obviously, he needs to have really close to 100% grip strength in order to have proper accuracy and to prevent fumbling. So it looks like it'll be another week for Fields, but I do expect him to come back soon and play really, really well. Hope he does as well in his place. Tyson Badgett hasn't been terrible. He did throw three picks last week, but tomorrow slash today's game, depending on when you're listening, I don't think it could get worse for a Thursday night game. And you got the Bears and the Panthers, which just looks like it's going to be a disgusting football game. And side note here, as bad as the Panthers have been, their defense has been decent. Just something to look out for if... You were playing. I don't think you play Tyson Pageant, but you know any of the guys there, like the running backs, the receivers, they're eighth in total yards, and actually the the Panthers are fifth in passing yards allowed. Um, and the Panthers, I guess, are just so bad because of their offense. But even before we wrote this show, or excuse me, before the the Fields news came out, I, I already was probably going to bench him this week just to wait and see. Guys, I like this week at the quarterback spot. As we transition here, I like Baker Mayfield, Goff, Purdy, maybe some Sam Howell because. There are some quarterback buys, and there's also some quarterbacks down, but it looks like we might have some quarterbacks back in action, Tom, and I'm talking about Kyler Murray. Is this finally his debut this week? It's looking that way, and a lot of reasons to be excited. The Cardinals have done, in my opinion, the right thing here. Now, say what you will about them tanking, not wanting to win. That's why he's not playing till now. Sure, but either way... This is about 10 months since his surgery. Because remember, his, his surgery wasn't until three or four weeks after his injury. So I believe his surgery was January 3rd. So he's a little over 10 months now, which is a reasonable time frame to return from an isolated ACL tear. He didn't have any other tissues involved. Now, reasonable to return, but is he going to be running at the peak Kyler Murray level that we know him to run at? Probably not. That's probably not going to be the case all season next season for sure no doubt but his throwing should be just fine now the thing with kyler is 30 percent of his fantasy points come on the ground so I, while i'm excited to watch him play excited to see what, how he looks physically i am not interested in having him on my fantasy team there's a lot of people right now saying oh kyler murray league winner well you're not going to have all of that 30 percent rushing upside and who does he have to throw to <laughs> like, uh, how could you possibly be excited about him in this offense? I understand he's a dynamic quarterback. He's fun to watch, but he's not going to have an elite couple of weeks here for our fantasy, from a fantasy standpoint. Right. I didn't real 30% of it. That's a, that, I mean, I know he's obviously a rushing quarterback and that's what brings him that great floor when he's in his prime, but 30% is pretty significant. And if you don't think that's going to be at full strength, Tom, I don't know who he's going to throw the ball to. You got Brown, uh, you know, you have who I'm going to talk about later, Trey McBride, who might come out. But I will say, Tom, there's something sketchy in the air about this game because how bad are the Cardinals? How awful are the Cardinals, right? One and eight. They play the Falcons this week. They are 1.5 point. Uh, favorites against, or excuse me, underdogs against the Falcons. So listen, as much as we think Mur Murray might not be ready, man, I don't know what's going to happen in this game, but Vegas believes in the cards a little bit. It's just a sketchy, weird game, but anything's better than than what Clayton Toon did. I don't know if you saw any of that game. I watched some highlights, man. Two picks, 
sacked seven times. The Cardinals, hold on, everybody, seven total first downs and 58 total yards. That sounds not very good. And I don't know, Tom, did you ever hear about the Kyler Murray Call of Duty thing, like how his numbers go down when Call of Duty comes out? Yes. Call of Duty, of course, <laughs> is coinciding with his return here. It gets released in like a couple of days, which I oh, wrote has... Goodness. I wrote in my notes, it's historically been an issue for Kyler Murray, but we, <laughs> we, we, we hope not. And, uh, you know, it, it is going to be fun to watch Kyler back. And, and I, you would probably not play him this week, Tom, just to wait a little bit. I mean, the Falcons D is also not a pushover at all, but you think you'd sit him if you have better options this week? Absolutely. I would not start him this week. Okay. Fair enough. Another guy, Tom, we're unfortunately all going to have to sit. He'll go to the IR in real life and in fantasy football is my home team quarterback, Daniel Jones. Brutal. Uh, you know, a bad season gets worse for the Giants. He has a torn ACL. What can you tell us about him, at least for next year? Or, or what kind of information can you give us on, on Danny Dimes here? So at the moment, from the information we have, it's reasonable for him to be ready to go week one. Let's think about our, our factors for readiness to return week one after an ACL age. He's 26. That's not working against him by any means. It would be better if he was 22, but that, that's not a problem, his age. Right. I have not heard that he's had surgery yet. Hopefully he can get that very soon. If he can get surgery, say this week, then it's about 10 months until week one. Let's hope it's not a situation where there's a lot of swelling and they have to wait a month before he can do surgery. By all reports, it's only an ACL injured. Although I did see something today where a reporter was probing him. Like, was it just an ACL? And Daniel Jones just didn't really answer them. Oh boy. So that is, that's something we need to look out for because if there's other stuff involved, it's going to slow down the first phases of rehab, which could possibly be an issue for him to be ready week one. Um, and then the, the final factor is, are they just like a different than the rest of us type of athlete? I would say no for Daniel Jones there. So right. the timeline here is the biggest one. If he can get surgery very soon, then he should totally be ready to go week one and not really see that significant of a drop off in production. I know he's like Kyler. He's also a runner, but he's not the same level of running as Kyler Murray. Um, so I wouldn't expect that much of a drop off for Daniel Jones when he returns next season. And he's I believe he's owed a lot of money. <laughs> so I am mad. I mean, it'll be interesting to see, though, what New York does, because if they do continue to stink, there's a lot of good quarterbacks in this draft. So yeah. I know they have a lot of money tied to Jones, but it'll be interesting to see what happens in the offseason. What there's a lot to unpack there and, and some really good thoughts. What I mean, really tough situation. But what would you do if you were the Giants and. They had one of those first couple picks. I mean, do you think it's time for them to move on? I, I'm so conflicted on him, and I'll talk about him in a second, but would you pull the trigger? Are you starting fresh? Or are you, you know, I don't know what they would do with the money, maybe trade him. They'd have to definitely eat a bunch of it, but would you grab a quarterback? What do you think? I totally would. I have never felt that Daniel Jones was very good. I think he's an okay quarterback, but I think we've seen his ceiling, and it's not anything special. And um, I th I don't know how you would move on from him, though. Like, you would have to, Smart. like you yep. said, you would have to eat a lot of that money. And I there's so many good quarterbacks in this draft, so you don't even know if the market's going to be good. But if they're picking top three, four, and there's some really good quarterbacks there, yeah, I'd definitely go after one. If they have a chance at Caleb, uh, they just have to. Uh, but it's like the sunken cost theory. I think you just you just pull the trigger at this point. Like as a Giants fan, it's frustrating. I do like him as a quarterback. It, real quick, how would you rank him? What is there? Thirty two teams. Where would you put him? I know you don't have a list in front of you, but like, is he? I just I, I, I'm putting him between fifteen and seventeen. Real life quarterback. Do you think that's accurate? You think worse, better? I'm I'm probably putting him. 20 at best i really don't think he's good we've really seen so many just dreadful games from him i think dable's brought the best out in him and i think he's done a really good job but you could be right that we've seen his ceiling i think that does make sense like is he okay is he real quick is he better or worse than mac jones oh he's better than mac jones okay hopefully i'm just warming you up tom uh russell wilson right now currently Right now, I would 
take Russell, but not by a lot. Jared Goff. Oh, Goff. 100%. I agree with that. Geno Smith. I would take Geno over Jones. Two more. Derek Carr. I would take Carr. All right. Okay. Uh, and how about Deshaun Watson as it stands right now? Uh, yes. I it's would tough. Take Watson. Dude, that like 14 to like 22 mix is just impossible. But again, I do think this firmly and, and it, the injury sucks for, for, you know, for the rest of our season and, and really for Daniel Jones, of course, but there, I think it's time for them to take a quarterback. I looked at their recent draft picks. I mean, it just hasn't, I mean, a couple of defensive guys, KB on Thibodeau has been awesome. I mean, they went with the line a couple of times with Andrew Thomas, Evan Neal, but like the receivers, Jalen Hyatt. Okay. Wandale Robinson. Okay. Remember they drafted Kadarius Tony. Like, I don't know. There's some decent pieces here. Their line's been terrible for the past couple of years. I just feel like they've been wasting Barkley and Barkley's prime. He's the only guy you can rely on going forward for fantasy. And last thing just on the giants here is this week, they are plus 16 and a half points against the Cowboys. Holy moly, that's going to be a blowout, and that will keep the Giants. I think that's the biggest spread I've seen in uh, at least this year. 16 and a half, and I, I do a pool with my dad every week. I'll take the Cowboys. I'll 100% take the Cowboys. DeVito, I don't even know if he could surpass 100 yards at this point. Like the Cowboys, which also, side note here, I'm rambling a lot today but that actually worries me for Cowboys fantasy options. I'm not sitting CD lamb. I'm not sitting Tony Pollard, but like DFS type of situation, like the Cowboys defense could score three times in this game. And then it's 28, nothing. And then you're like, okay, well huh, no offense. And then you have whoever, who's their backup, uh, the Cooper rush. Maybe I don't freaking know, but maybe <laughs> Sounds Trey right. Lance is there. Is he? Okay. Maybe yeah. we Trey Lance is sneaky DFS play. Now don't quote me on that. All right. Let's move on, Tom. Got a lot of players to go through here. So David Montgomery, he is expected back this uh, this week with a rib injury. Uh, been okay, 16.4 points per game. But what can you tell us about Monty? Yeah, he's been very good when he was, was playing this season. Uh, ribs are <clears throat> challenging when you have the injury, but he's three or so weeks out now. That's enough time for the pain to really be under control. He practiced full today. I expect no hindrance whatsoever from this injury. We've obviously seen Jameer Gibbs start to emerge, but uh, we'll see them both play, no doubt. They'll both get a lot of touches, a lot of valuable touches in this offense, and I think they can both be productive at the same time. 100% plug and play. Now, Chargers, who they do play, have a pretty good run day, sixth in the league, allowing only 89 rush yards per game. But listen, Monty's been a stud. His usage is absolutely elite. They're coming off a bye. Gibbs had a tremendous game in week eight. I think he's going to be more involved. But Dan Campbell's pretty set in his ways. He likes this two-headed or two-headed monster backfield. And like you said, Tom, if you don't have concerns, I don't have concerns. So I'm all in for him and for Gibbs. Another guy expected back is, and this could be why that spread in the Falcons uh, Cardinals game is so low. James Connor expected to be back as well. Says he's ready to go with a knee injury. It was the knee, right? Yes, it was a knee injury. He was on the IR, so he's had over a month to rehab. That's generally plenty of time for these types of injuries. And uh, Gannon said that he looked fast. He looked good in practice. I haven't seen um, any reports that he's like definitely going to play yet, but I would anticipate that coming later in the week anyway. So as long as Friday, if he logs a, a full practice and it sounds like he's going to play, you can definitely put him back in your lineups. I know this offense stinks. Kyler Murray will make it better than it was before. And Connor was playing really, really well, even with Josh Dobbs at quarterback. And um, yeah, you can, you can definitely play him. And um, like I said, more than enough time for this type of injury to be totally out of the picture at this point. Fair enough. And they need him. I think Cotter will be a fine RB2 going forward as long as he could stay healthy in the games he's played, 11.1 points per game, which is solid. And the rest of this backfield has been a dumpster fire. You got who? Amari DiMercato. You got Keontae Ingram. They were giving the ball to Daryl Williams. Like, it's a whole mess. They need him back. And I'm going to say this again. I, the, I don't understand the spread. I just don't get it. The Cardinals, even their implied total, Vegas has them scoring over 21 points this week. Like, I don't know. It's could. It's because of Murray. It's because of Connor. It's because I don't know. But 
I think Connor could be a sneaky little play this week against the Falcons, even in a DFS situation. Or, you know, I think if you have him, you plug and play as long as he plays. Okay. Next guy, another guy returning. You were right in the beginning of the show, Tom. We got Khalil Herbert back from an ankle injury. He was on IR. I think he missed four games, right? So is he going to be okay to play? Can we trust him? What do you think? It looks like he's on track to play uh, Thursday night. He had that high ankle sprain in week five in which we saw him try to return in that game and immediately went right to the ground after trying to push off that leg. Characteristic instability with the high ankle sprain. But he's had over four weeks to rehab now. So these high ankle sprains, they can be tricky because they can linger because what happens is the two bones, the tibia and the fibula, get slightly pulled away from each other creating instability in the ankle and depending on how bad it is they may not just become back to back into place they, they may they may or they may not depending on the severity and sometimes what happens when they don't fully form back together there's just lingering stiffness and instability in, in that ankle but that doesn't always affect production from a running back standpoint in fact our data set which has i believe 28 running backs on it they average no drop off in fantasy production in their first game back. And as many as 40% of them are meeting or exceeding like right where they left off from a production standpoint. So I'm not concerned there. There are concerns for this causing or being a factor in future injuries. If that ankle function is not the same as it once was, we saw Jonathan Taylor last year, high ankle sprain three times, but even in the medical literature, ankle dysfunctions can predispose knee and hip and back injuries. So that's just something we need to look out for right now. It's not something that you need to make any decision on. Are you going to keep Khalil Herbert or trade him about? But just just be mindful. Maybe you keep an extra depth piece in your running back backfield on your roster. As far as his outlook for Thursday, from a per play standpoint, I expect him to be fine. But he's entering a backfield with yeah. Dante Foreman, who's looked really good. Roshan Johnson, the rookie, they want to get going. Khalil Herbert was averaging 64% of the snaps. I don't see that happening on Thursday night. No, no. So will his fantasy output take a hit? Probably, but I think it's more from a snap share versus this injury. Really, really good analysis, Tom. Thank you. And I was benching him. I'm glad that you think he'll be okay health-wise. And, and again, that reassures my thoughts on him. But it also, again, I'm very deterred from playing him this week because what reason do the Bears really have or what motivation do they really have for feeding him in this game that we think the ball is not going to really be moved too much? Like, it's a sketchy situation, at least for now. It's a short week. The Bears are atrocious. And Dante Foreman's been fine. Like, I don't see Khalil Herbert coming back the first week and just getting the lion's share. Or what'd you say, Tom? 64%, 64% of snaps. Yeah. There's, there's no chance. Roshan's snap count was very low last week. I saw it was it, it was really low. But again, like you said, they want to get him going. So I'm listen, I'm I'm excited that he's back, but I am avoiding Herbert everywhere I can, unless I'm desperate, um, just until we could see what he can do here. All righty. Another guy that this guy's been a bust, and I was on board with him. We're talking Damian Pierce here in the beginning of the year. Has an ankle injury now, and they talked a lot, man. Preseason, I'm thinking back, like they talked about how he might be in this three-down role now. That kind of never you know, crystallized, but I think he's probably a low-end flex play the rest of the year. I know he missed last week, but I actually haven't really even seen updates for him. Tom, what can you tell us about Pierce? It's an ankle injury that kept him out last week. Did not practice today on Wednesday, so it's not a great start to the week, but he still has two days to get some work in. These type of injuries are going to be more impactful for the the backs that are change of direction agility guys. He's more of a downhill runner, so that does work in his favor, that this type of injury is not going to impact his running style quite as much. On average, we see running backs see a dip of about 11% fantasy production in their first game back. Not not huge, but again, like you mentioned, this Damian Pierce has not been productive this year. No. So if that coupled with the injury, I don't like starting him this week if I can avoid it. I, I would definitely advise against starting him if he plays. 
super borderline start to me. And I think it's going to be more of the same of last week. I'm not going to predict a CJ Stroud performance like he had last week, but they play the Bengals. They're pretty heavy underdogs, even with all those Bengals injuries. So I think it's going to be throw, throw, throw for the Texans. And Tom, you said you have CJ Stroud in one of your leagues. Again, he beat my ass. I think he put up almost 40 freaking points, man. Five touchdowns, zero picks, and 470 yards, man. What an insane performance. He, Do you know whose record he set? He set the rookie game passing record held by... Uh, Andrew Luck, right? Correct, Andrew Luck. A couple, oh, more than a couple, but... Some years back. 2012. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah, I don't know the year. Remember? Do you remember that page of Andrew Luck, how they made him out to look like a Civil War? Uh, I don't know if you ever used to follow yes. that. I forget yes. what it was called, but he literally looked like like a Confederate general or a Union general for the Civil War, like right and back. To, I forget what the hell the page was, but I miss Andrew Luck. What a guy. You're a history teacher. You teach American history, right? I teach a little bit of everything, but yeah. Which team... Which side of the Civil War do you think Andrew Luck would have been on? Uh, there's so there's so many parts to that. Like if I say Confederate, then like we just make him sound like he's like a Southern like racist at the time. Like if I said North, like I, I do his appearance, non nothing to do with his belief system, but his appearance looks like a grizzled Georgia Southern guy. So I would say Confederate for that reason, but. I'm not trying to insult anybody with. Okay, moving on because we do have some Southern listeners, Tom, and, and we love all of our listeners here at the uh, Fancy Injury Team. All right. Next guy, man, is a guy who I drafted everywhere. And I want to go back to September and August and punch myself in the face and punch myself in the face again because I have Cam Akers in about three leagues and I bought into it. And I thought he was going to be what? Kyron Williams was. I was like, the guy in that role is the guy I want. And I was all in on it being Akers. It wasn't. Of course, he gets traded. And now this really sucks for him. An Achilles injury. Is this something that's like, I'm not going to say career ending, but like it's his second one, right? Like this is, this doesn't sound good. It's career threatening. That much is for sure. One Achilles tear is career threatening. Two, I don't know of a single skill position player that's come back from two Achilles tears. I know uh, Brandon Brooks, the Eagles guard, had two, and he came back and played well, but that's a totally different position and totally different ask, mm -hmm. physical demand. Is this, this the is, same one or a different one? I, I, no, this is the other Achilles. Oh, my gosh. So it would actually, I mean, neither would be good, but no. what we know from the medical literature is that most people never fully regain the strength or the muscular endurance of that calf Achilles complex. So now he's got not one, but two calf and Achilles that likely are not going to ever be a hundred percent what they were when he entered the league. So that's going to impact acceleration is the big one change of direction. Top end sprint speed is affected too, but running backs rarely even get to their top end speed unless they're breaking a long run. So it's really the, the acceleration that is very, very impacted by this type of injury. We are, of course, the Aaron Rodgers discussion comes up where he had this new procedure, which maybe acres will, will get that same procedure. I believe, uh, well, acres is in Minnesota now, not LA, but I'm pretty sure the surgeon that did Rogers procedure is out of LA which it doesn't mean that Akers can't go to that guy. Right. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if he has that procedure, which clearly has a um, advanced aggressive rehab protocol. But still, this is the largest tendon in the body. It needs to take on up to 10 times your body weight and force. He's a 220-pound back. Yep. So that's 2,200 pounds of force he needs to be able to withstand. This is going to be a, a big challenge for him to return and be competitive in the NFL. Hopefully he can do it. Um, obviously you're dropping him in redraft. If I have him in dynasty, if I can get a fourth round draft pick, I will gladly take it. I fear this is, and even just really listening to what you just said, I do fear this is a career again, threatening is I guess the word we'll use. I just don't know if he's going to be fantasy relevant again, because even before the injury, he was basically vanishing into thin air in terms of fantasy relevance here. But 
just a guy that never materialized for me, man. Again, I had the faith, but you know, just on not LA anymore, of course, on, on Minnesota. Still got Madison there. I mean, I guess this is just going to mean more carries for him, even though he continues to be one of the worst running backs in football. But listen, he's trusted by Kevin O'Connell. Guy to look at, maybe, who I don't even think is that good, but just a name to look out for, Ty Chandler, maybe, just possibly rosterable, scoop him, throw him in your last bench spot and see what the hell happens. Um, but in the game last week, some positive news, at least another great story there. Josh Dobbs beating the Falcons after being traded to Minnesota. I don't even know how many days before, dude, the post game cigars or, oh no, that was the Raiders, but the post game celebrations, the post game, like he was just, people were going nuts for him and it, I'm very happy for him. He's a good guy. He's a good quarterback. I didn't even know the guys on the field he was throwing the ball to, but the good news is he beat Arthur Smith. So here's my regular weekly scheduled uh, 30 second discussion on the Falcons. Arthur Smith, he just sucks ass is what it comes down to. Tyler, uh, he just continues to use this, the bad people. Here we go. Once again, it's the story of the year. Tyler Algier, everybody. 12 carries for 39 yards equals not good equals 3.3 yards per carry. Well, guess what? He out carried Bijan who had only 11 carries and by the way, 51 yards and 4.6 yards per carry. Much better. Bijan, two catches for eight yards. Cool. Algier had two catches. You know how many yards? Negative nine. That doesn't sound like he's going the right direction, right? Neither is Arthur Smith's brain. I went to the New York Marathon this week and, and hung up a sign in the, in the streets of Manhattan that said, uh, fire Arthur Smith. I'm excited. And hopefully, I keep talking about that game, Tom. Hopefully, the Cardinals pull it off this week. And I'm celebrating in the streets as Smith does get fired. But Ken, back to Cam Makers, who started all this. So, you know, again, we wish him the best of luck. And I just think it just means more for Madison. And again, a possible boost to Ty Chandler. All righty. We, by the way, are thrilled to be partnering with SeatGeek. Go see your favorite team, Fantasy Stars, in action. Use the promo code INJURYFANTASY. That's one word. And they will take $20 off the top of your purchase. So it's basically a free $20 at SeatGeek using injury fantasy. Next up, we've got some Bengals. Uh, Jamar Chase and Tom, I guess we could stick in T. Higgins, who was a late addition to our show and to the injury report, but reports seemed pessimistic on Chase from what I saw, and then Higgins I don't really know too much about. So talk us through the Cincinnati wide receivers. Well, let's start with Chase. He's dealing with back injury. We saw him land hard on it on Sunday. He was pessimistic, um, but here's what I typically see clinically. So we know from imaging that there's no structural damage. So that's good. I see all the time people come in my office with a recent onset of back pain, and it is debilitating. It really is. And it's usually the most pain anyone's ever been in. And if you've ever had low back pain, you can't really do much because you move your arms, your back's involved, you bend forward, oh, that's your back getting stressed, you get in and out of a chair. Everything, there's forces going through the back. So when you're in a lot of pain, it's very hard to do anything and you think the world's ending. But acute low back pain, acute meaning it like just happened, actually responds really quickly to treatment most of the time if you do the right treatments which I, I, I'm sure the Cincinnati staff <laughs> is able to do to identify what, what needs yeah, to be sure. done. Yeah. So I'm not that concerned at the moment right now. Of course, we'll see how he does throughout the week. But this is the type of injury that t can absolutely get under control enough by Sunday that he can still play and play at a very high level. This isn't too different than Jalen Waddell a few weeks ago who had a back injury and was able to play and, and it wasn't hindered by the injury. So, of course, we'll look out for how things progress throughout the week. I'll be all over this on Twitter and Instagram and all that. But if he's practicing Friday, I'm starting him Sunday. Fair enough. And, again, I think, like you said, Tom, I, I would think that the Bengals are treating it right. And I feel like there's just, like, mixed reports all week. Like, he was super, again, pessimistic in the beginning of the week. Like, sounded like he was going to miss time. But I guess, like you said, with treatment, it responds. So, if he's playing, I'm playing him. Um, you know, t did you talk about T. Higgins? Did you? So, Higgins is a different story because yeah. he came out of the game no problem. 
injures his hamstring today, Wednesday, in practice. And the reports that I saw is that after practice, he was walking around real gingerly in the locker room. That's one that we need to definitely keep our eye on because that could absolutely impact his ability to play this weekend. Hopefully it's minor and that he can get back to playing. But right now, what's kind of challenging is if you look on the various different fantasy platforms, it says Higgins limited in practice. But you got to dig deeper to learn that limited because he got injured in practice, which is obviously worse than getting injured in the game and then being limited in practice. So that one I am concerned about. Um, Another one that I'll be all over on Twitter and Instagram to uh, provide updates for, but as it stands, definitely concerned. Receivers see an average drop of about 14% in fantasy production when they return. A player of Higgins' caliber, that's not that crazy, but we've also seen this is a guy who we will think will play through an injury, and not to no fault of his own, probably somebody else making the decision, he'll suit up and then not really play. All righty. A lot to digest, but all makes sense. And what I'm gathering from all this is, as I'm doing right now sitting here, and he's unavailable in every league except one, I am running to the waiver wire and making sure Tyler Boyd is on a team. Because if he, if any of these guys don't go or are limited, Boyd is going to be the one that reaps the benefits there. Um, if one of these guys, Higgins or Chase, does sit, DFS-wise, I'll be with the 80% of other teams that do have Boyd on their team. But we're hoping for the best for these guys. And you know, Tom will, of course, be on it like he always is. Next guy is a shoulder injury. Well, that's not a guy. That's the injury. The guy is Debo Samuel. He uh, has had two spike weeks this year. Otherwise, been disappointing. I think the upside is too big to sit him unless you tell me differently. What do you got on Debo? He missed the last several weeks with a hairline fracture in his shoulder. That means it's like a really small fracture, and it's been four weeks, so that's basically resolved by now it's, it's healed enough to the point there's no pain no limitations in function and not a major risk risk for re-injury full practice today i expect him to pick up and play like the superstar that he is not in- inhibited by this injury at all dude's a stud could take one touch or one end around to the house he's awesome and don't be deterred. You, If you drafted Debo Samuel, you pick the type of player who's going to have spike weeks and the type of player who's going to come out and give you nothing. But you play him, you ride the highs and ride the lows. Like This offense, I was thinking, I want to compare this offense a little bit to that of the Chiefs in like, you don't know who's going to have a good game. Like the Chiefs, it's always Kelsey and then like, who the hell knows who? Although Rasheed Rice has been pretty good, but is it going to be Justin Watson? Is it going to be this guy, that guy? Like, it's kind of the same in a way uh, with the 49ers. Like, you know, CMC is going to have a good game. And then who's it going to be? Is it going to be Ayuk that week? Is it going to be Kittle who has spike weeks? Is it going to be Debo? But again, if you drafted Debo, um, you're playing him. So Tom doesn't see, seem to have any concerns here for him from an injury perspective, which is good news. Next guy up, we got one, two, three, four, five, six players left rolling right through. We've got Drake London, who has a groin injury, and he's been okay. What can you tell us about him? Is he going to play this week? What do you got on Drake London? Well, receivers average missing a game and a half. So if he does play this week, it's kind of right on track. He missed the one game. He did practice a little bit today, which is a really good sign. And we really don't see this affect receivers. We have a sample size of 40 that shows no decline in fantasy production on average after a groin injury. So whether... You, he was a starter for you or not before injury is what is going to matter here. But you, if he plays this week, you don't need to factor this injury negatively against him. Okay. The only thing, of course, you do have to factor in is Arthur Smith as his head coach. But <laughs> on a more serious note, he his performance, Drake London, although it was a slower start, has been really consistent since week four. So since week four, half point PPR, Drake London. 10.3, 11.7, then he had a nice 17, 8.4, and 8. So he's been okay, and he's been playable. He's not killing you. Targets have been, you know, the first week was 1, and then after that, 8, 6, 7, 9, 12, 7, 7. So, again, I really do think all seriousness, Smith, Arthur Smith's play calling does limit this offense and, and limit Drake London's great potential, but 
I like Heineke. I think you should give at least London and Pitt some of these guys a nice boost going forward, especially this week against the Cardinals who have struggled. All righty. Tom, you tell me that Christian Watson is not hurt. Correct. We don't have to really worry about him. We think he's a full go. He was listed after the game with a chest and back injury, but he was a full participant in practice today. And Green Bay does not have him listed on their injury report. Fair enough. I have him listed on my bench because I just don't think he's having a very good season at 5.5 points per game. Christian Watson. I know he's dealt with a lot, but wide receiver 86 on the season. I know he's been out for some games, but even so, man. It's tough, although I have seen some analysts calling for a spike week here from Watson, but I will have him on my bench, and if it happens, it happens, but I'm not dealing with him again. Joshua Palmer, another player, man, knee, IR. He Wasn't there another injury he had? Because like a couple of weeks ago, he played through something. Was it something different? No, same thing. It was the same injury. Okay, and he played through it. I guess he – well, I'll let you talk about it, but he aggravated it? Like what? what's the that, deal with that? That's how it sounds. It was a knee injury that he went into uh, week eight with, and then uh, last week he was uh, questionable all week until finally they put him on the IR. So – He'll be out four weeks, including last week. I believe that would include last week. So he should be back for fantasy playoffs. This is a guy that's not going to win your league, but he can be a nice role player on your team. I'm with you. He comes back week 14. You probably wouldn't want to thrust him right into your lineup. But again, if he comes back week 14, looks good. Like he's a guy you put as your wide receiver three or your flex. Like definitely keep him on your roster. And I asked you this a couple of weeks ago, and I think you said, hold on to him and be patient. And I said the same thing. How about Quentin Johnston now? Can we, are you still holding on? Because he's a guy that I probably had in my seven, eight leagues. I probably had him in three or four leagues. I was like, yo, I was begging preseason, Tom. I was like, yo, if if Mike Williams or Keenan Allen goes down, we have a stud here. And now we have Josh Palmer down and Mike Williams down. And I don't even know if he's rosterable. Like, what the hell am I doing here? What I don't know. I just don't know. know. It's getting harder and harder to believe in him. It is. Um, I I don't know. In redraft, no, I don't think you need to roster him. In um in dynasty, obviously you're gonna keep him. But yeah, yeah I think if you need the space in redraft, drop him. I don't know what to do. I mean, uh, diving into his statistics has Quentin Johnston. 20 receiving yards or less in seven of his eight games. He's on pace for 272 yards, which, oh my God, Tyreek Hill gets on one play somehow. That math doesn't add up, but <laughs> 272. 0.76 yards per route run. That's his PFF you know, score or, great, or yards per route run, which, by the way, is 94th of 101 qualifying wide receivers for this year, and that also is 15 out of 15 for qualifying rookie wide receivers. And beyond that, I looked at the tape. He's not getting separation at all. He's not getting open. They look his way. He might not be getting the targets. They look at him. They have a couple first look or first reads for him or even second in the progression. He's just not open. So I don't know what to do with him. The answer there is just Keenan Allen, and that's it. It's just Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, and and good night. And Jalen Guyton is going to score a 74-yard touchdown this week, and, and we're all going to be like, okay, great. That doesn't help anybody. All right, Tom, tight ends. We got three left. Uh, we got Hawkinson, Komet, and Goddard. Let's start with TJ Hawkinson, who is battling some rib injuries, correct? What, what's up with TJ? Yes, so rib injuries when it's not a fracture, or kind of even when it is a fracture, it's you're dealing with pain management because these ribs are highly innervated by the nervous system, so very sensitive when they get injured. More than that, though, the some major muscles like the obliques, the lats, and the pecs attach on those ribs, and they are constantly contracting and stretching with athletic motions. So when they are attaching to a site of the rib that's injured, that can hurt really bad, but also those muscles can really tighten, clamp down, which can impact range of motion. So those are just the things that the medical staff needs to address, needs to make sure everything is moving fine, which they should be able to do. He did practice a little bit today, which tells us it's not too severe, not like a David Montgomery situation who missed a couple games. So generally, these types of injuries, they're painful for the athlete, but they can still play through them and play pretty well. Hawkinson's been really, really good this year, so you're going to keep starting him. 
Lock and load, getting pepper with targets. 9.8 targets is his average over the last five games. TJ Hawkinson, get him in your lineup. And that's actually the only position this year, Tom, that's been predictable now that I think about it. At least your top three. You got Kelsey one, you got uh, Andrews two, and you got Hawkinson three. Forget who four is. I know five is commit right now because of his touchdowns. Who the hell would four be? I think Kittle's like seven. Um, it's not Waller, obviously. It's not. It might be. It might be like John U. Smith. <laughs> no, I, I, can't I don't know. To be honest, it's not Dalton Schultz. Um, Dallas Goddard was like in the mix. He was like nine. If you're in the audience right now, do some thinking. The audience. If you're if you're out there listening, help us think through this and shout it to your your car. Um. All right, Tom. Before we we look more silly, why don't you talk to us about Cole Komet and his knee? Oh, Laporta. Oh, duh. Okay. I was gonna say I'll Google it, but okay. Yeah, Laporta. Laporta's at a freaking he's he's another guy. He's probably is he the dynasty tight end two you're the dynasty guy. Two one well, like, you... uh Kincaid would have been the first drafted and Laporta No, would've... like right now, like ranking wise, like right, oh, you know. Uh, prob- probably him or um trying to think, who are some of the younger tight ends. Tight ends don't really age. So um I mean, you have Luke Musgrave, who hasn't been much. You have yeah. Meyer or Mayer. Oh, you, you, you're talking just rookies. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm not. I'm just mentioning rookies. But I'm trying to also like Andrews is older. Kelsey old. Uh, Waller's low thirties. Yeah. Um, right. Laporte is probably number one. Then would be my thought. Like if a redraft were to start at in right. the off season or, That's or what I'm a saying, startup yeah. draft, yeah, he'd probably be the first tight end. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. How about Cole Komet? So this guy, this guy is either elite when he scores touchdowns, or you know what? This is why he's tight in five because even if he doesn't score, he gives you like six or seven, which won't kill you. Like I think he's turned into a lock play. But is he going to be able to play this week at least with the, yeah. with the knee injury? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's off the injury report. No concerns there. Oh. Um, he's a, he's also one that my three and six team that's rallying is rallying behind. So uh, I will be locked into the game tomorrow to watch Cole Komet. <laughs> there's, there's nothing like locking into a Bears Panthers game on a Thursday night. <laughs> God, I'm gonna look for something else to do tomorrow. I'm actually going to the zoo tomorrow. Very very excited about oh, that. That'll be so, fun. That'll be more fun than this football game. And our last guy, Tom, and then you got some other guys to mention. Dallas Goddard, and this one is t- fractured forearm, but I'm seeing like four or five week recovery. Is that right? That's it. Like he's back to play or back like what do you have on on dallas goddard yeah check out our instagram fantasy injury team i put out a, a, a pretty detailed video a, a reel i believe is the terminology ah. um the other day but yeah you can see the defender traps goddard's arm and as they fall to the ground the well one goddard's arm just falls straight outstretched onto the ground which we call a foosh fall on an outstretched hand but more than that, the defender also lands on it. So totally perfect way to break your arm. Um, but it sounds like it was a clean break with no additional tissues involved. So they'll do a surgery to fixate it. And then, yeah, four weeks would be the early. That would probably be a little too early. But by six weeks, he should be back. And that's week 16, which is your fantasy playoffs. Yeah. And not only back, but back with no restrictions and no decline in, in production. I and mean, we saw Zach Moss with a similar injury miss six weeks and then put up 18.7 points in his first game back different position, obviously, but the point is it's an upper body injury. That's not going to affect their ability to do athletic things. Fair enough. All right. That does it for our main players, I guess. Is there anybody else you're looking at monitoring is, you know, that we missed? Yeah, the other two, this one literally just came up before we came on air, so I have not read up much on it, but Ken Walker apparently missed practice with a chest injury. I will definitely get more detail on that throughout the week. And Nico Collins limited in practice with a calf injury. This one's interesting because we see a gigantic dip in fantasy production in receivers after a calf injury, 45% dip in fantasy production on average. And that's a sample size of 16. And in that sample size, only one player met or exceeded their pre-injury average. That means 15 out of 16 players are not 
scoring as many points as they're averaging in their first game after that injury. So that's one that we're also going to need to monitor really closely. All right. That wraps up our injury portion. And now we slide on to what's been a rough segment for uh, myself so far this year, or at least recently. And you could tell us how you did last week, Tom, because I always forget your picks, but then you remind me. I'm like, oh, okay. But our sleeper picks, everybody. So as we know, we're teaming up with our friends at Sleeper. Everybody go to sleeper.com. Go check it out. Sleeper.com slash promo slash fit. They will match $100 for you. So once again, sleeper.com slash promo slash fit for a $100 match. I'll go first. I will, uh, I'll bite the bullet here. It's been a struggle. I am, am open in saying that I have not been great at this, and it's, it's, it's a lot harder than it looks, damn it. I started 3-0, and and I've dropped my last six. Now, so, some of this is bad luck. Like, I, the one week I missed Hawkinson by one yard, the, the week I took Pittman, he had like 15 targets, and he only had like 30 yards or 40 yards. Last week, I'm all in on Jalen Waddle and first play of the game. I don't know if you watched the game. It was Sunday morning. Um, nice catch. And then the next play goes down, gets hurt. So he plays the rest of the game banged up and hurt. So I lose that one. So I'm coming back this week. And and Tom, mark my words here. If I don't hit this week, I am changing everything. And I am going to become the under guy. And I'm going to follow your lead from a week ago or from whatever you did. I'm going to start taking unders because I'm sick of losing, but I have a good feeling about this like I have this week now. I know I'm talking a lot, so thank you for your patience, everybody. There's no line out for this yet. So to be fair, I'm just going to say, I'm going to, my bet this week is Trey McBride, the tight end for the Cardinals. Whatever, as soon as the line comes out, I will tweet it from our page and I'll say, this is Joe's pick. Whatever his receiving yardage is at around whatever it is, minus 110, I'm going to take that. So the Trey McBride over receiving yards is going to be my pick. I like this game. I want to stake in this game. Again, I think it's going to be really competitive. I love that Kyler Murray is going to be back. The Cardinals throw a very, very high percentage of throws to their tight ends. We saw that with Zach Ertz. And again, with Connor being back, I think they'll be able to move the ball better. Um, the Falcons have a pretty good defense. They've been able to get pressure on the quarterback this year from the games that I've seen. Um, so that means a lot of quick passes to running backs and to tight ends. I like Trey McBride. He's a young guy. I think he's 22, 23, something like that. He's 6'4", 250 or something like that. I think he's a pretty good player. So am I allowed to do that, Tom? Just the over on Trey McBride? It's early. It's Wednesday. It's hard to find lines already, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows I'm taking the over on whatever his yardage is released at when it first comes out. Is that is that legal? <laughs> it's bold, but sure, go for it. I, I, I got to get bold or different or downright stupid at this point, but it stuck out to me in, in all of my research. Okay. What'd you take last week? I forget. Uh, I, I don't remember. I'll have to go back to <laughs> watch the film on that. One. I really don't remember. I get sure, back to the locker and watch some tape. On it. Yeah, I'm sure it hit though. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this week, this one is too easy. I'm taking Tommy DeVito under 164.5 yards. It's that's like it's oh, so wow. easy. Uh, Dallas has the fourth best pass defense, averaging 179 yards, which obviously is more than 164.5. But they have not played a quarterback as bad as Tommy DeVito, or on a team that's as dysfunctional. Um, Michael Parsons is going to eat his lunch, and he's going to come back, <laughs> and he's going to come back and eat his dinner too. <laughs> so this one's just this is too obvious. How could you not take it? He's gonna have a full course meal that game. I mean, I, the only way that doesn't hit is if the Giants just have to throw fifty times and Devito's not pulled and he just connects on fifteen of forty seven for a whatever it is. But what's the at the what's the average the Cowboys are allowing? Only one hundred and seventy nine. Yep. Where'd they make this line? That's all. So 15 yards less than their average to a quarterback that we haven't seen being capable of throwing the ball past the line of scrimmage like that. I don't know where you found these lines. He, he did throw for 175 last week, but that's, he did. Not, that's not happening again. I don't think it is either against the Cowboys. All right. Two more segments, Tom. Here we go. We've got the cue the music. Let's make this music loud this week, Tom. Cue the vampire diary music. 
We won the league. We got not the league. Up, oh, God. Now I just jinxed myself, and now I don't have a chance. Okay, we won the matchup. We gutted it out in a battle of attrition, eighty-two seventy-five. So my options to steal this week were it was tough. It wasn't much. Um, Lamar Jackson, Gus Edwards, or Garrett Wilson were the only players I would even consider taking from that team. I didn't want Edwards because what's his name? The guy Mitchell got a whole bunch of carries for the Ravens and Justice Hill. So. At Garrett Wilson, I, why do I want him right now? So I took Lamar. I think it's a good move. I mean, I already have Tua, but listen, record Vampire League now six and three. And when healthy, here's the squad: got Lamar Jackson or Tua, quarterback, my choice. Running back Tony Pollard and Raheem Mostert. Receivers Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase. Tight end I got Dalton Kincaid, and then for the flex bench we got Chris Olave, Nico Collins, Puka Nakua, Kyron Williams, JSN. I need a running back. I need a running back bad, Tom. I mean, not terribly. I have Pollard and Mostert, but I need to win this week. I play Baldino. He has Derrick Henry, Alvin Kamara, and Travis Etienne. That's a big one. That's that, a good backfield. Uh, gun to your head right now. Who are you taking of those three? Henry, Kamara, Etienne. Etienne. Me too. Who's two? Kamara. Okay. I'm on the same boat as you. But if I could get one of these running backs, I'll feel really, really good about it. All right. Last part, a little trivia question for you guys out there. And last week, the answer, Tom, I think you guessed 1950s in the spirit of Halloween. Well, trick-or-treating, everybody, was actually introduced and became very popular in America in the 1930s. The 1930s. Okay. Now that Halloween is over, back to the boring history stuff, although I don't think it's boring. And I bet you Tom's going to have a great time at this and probably have no clue who the answer is. Who is the longest reigning monarch? in world history so that would be a king queen prince have you whatever who served the longest in world history ever the answer is a lot of years and take some time to think about that send us a message at injury underscore fantasy and uh, we'll, we'll give you a chance to win a prize maybe a signed jersey maybe something fun we'll send you we'll send tom to your house to hang out with you for a day but Tom, do you have any educated guesses before we say goodbye? It's got to be one of the guys from like the Chinese dynasties, right? Good thinking, but no. It is somebody from, I don't want to give too many hints. A European monarch is the best I could do for you. Hmm. I don't know. I got I got to think about that one. <laughs> we'll let you ponder it over the week uh, over the week here. But Tom, great show, man. Thank you so much for being here. Always, always really really great time and we appreciate you guys out there cuz th there's no show without you. So we appreciate you being here with us. Go crush it this week and and good luck. And we'll see you next time on the Fantasy Injury Team podcast.